Hi, today we're going to talk about IGF-1, which is insulin-like growth factor 1, and how it's important and how it relates to the science of fasting. So IGF-1 is also called somatomedin C, and as its name implies, is one of the more important growth hormones that we have. So as you might expect, it peaks during puberty as uh, kids are growing up, and then during adulthood continuously drops until you get into your 60s and 70s when it gets to very low levels. At this point it's called somatopause and this uh, is also seen in other animals and particularly mammals. IGF-1 is produced by the liver and stimulated by something that is released by the pituitary gland called the growth hormone. And in addition to cell proliferation, it does other things as well, cell differentiation, and it inhibits apoptosis, which is programmed cell death. So you can see that it's really a very pro-growth uh, hormone. Initially, it was thought that this would be a very effective way to reverse some of the changes of aging because, hey, if IGF-1 is low, um, then maybe if you give people IGF-1 or growth hormone, that's going to be a way to reverse some of these changes. And in 1990, a group published a study in the New England Journal of Medicine that showed that, hey, perhaps there may be something to that thought. So when they administered this human growth hormone for six months, they saw that people got more lean mass, they lost body fat, and increased bone density. It was an 8% increase in, in lean body mass, accompanied by a 14.4% decrease in adipose tissue mass, and a much smaller 1.6% increase in lumbar vertebral density, and skin thickness increased by 7.1%. So it sounded really good because as you get older, your bones get a little um, weaker, your skin gets a little thinner, perhaps you could be anti-aging. And it became very, very popular through the 1990s and early 2000s. However, by 2007, a lot of problems were starting to show up. A meta-analysis uh, published that year showed that really there were some minor benefits, a slightly higher lean mass, a slightly lower uh, body fat mass, but not nearly as impressive as the earlier ones, but really some substantial risks as well. That is, growth hormone uh, in excess can lead to joint pains, carpal tunnel syndrome, and diabetes uh, risk. So it really fell out of favor in terms of treatment as an anti-aging hormone. IGF-1 also um, affects almost every cell in the body, which is why it's thought to be so important for overall growth. And it binds to the IGF-1 receptor and activates the AKT signaling pathway, which is, again, one of these pro-growth pathways that resides in almost all mammalian cells. And the major role is to signal two things to the cell, that is, insulin is a major nutrient sensor. That is, it tells your body that food is coming in because it's important to link food, availability, and growth. You don't want to grow when there's no food available. You're going to die. On the other hand, when food is available, you want to signal to your body that cells should grow, 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 because that's the time to do it. You make hay while the sun shines. So that's why there's such a tight link between insulin, which is a nutrient sensor, and insulin-like growth factor, which is very, very similar, which is growth, nutrients, and growth. Really two sides of the same coin from an evolutionary standpoint. So what's the link between IGF-1 and longevity? Well, if high levels are not good, maybe low levels are good. And one of the thoughts is that there is a link to cancer. High levels of growth hormone and IGF-1 have been associated with certain types of cancer, prostate cancer, breast cancer, lung cancer, and colorectal cancer. Anywhere between a 50 to 100% increase in the risk with certain types of cancer. 
So the question is, is it good to have high levels or is it good to have low levels? And that's why this study published by Dr. Longo and his colleagues is so important because they showed the association between IGF-1 levels and all-cause mortality. So let's look at this study a little closer. This was a meta-analysis. So what the researchers did was they combed through all available literature on the subject and they, what they found after all of it is 19 studies and 30,876 participants. When they looked at this question of, hey, is IGF levels related to risk of dying or mortality? What they found was that there didn't seem to be any kind of relationship. But because they were able to look at multiple studies, a closer examination of the results showed something very interesting. That is, both high levels of IGF-1 and very low levels of IGF-1 are associated with poor outcomes. So what you see is a dose-response relationship and a U-shaped curve where you want to be somewhere in the middle and you don't want to be too high or too low, which makes sense because you don't want too much growth when you're not supposed to be growing and you don't want too little growth. In this day and age, one of the things that we tend to have is obesity rather than undernutrition. And therefore, we're probably more concerned about high IGF-1 levels in this current time. Nutrition is actually one of the most important modulators of IGF-1. So what they did in this study is compared the nutrients from the NHANES-3 study, which is a very uh, large survey of the dietary habits of Americans, and they tried to correlate it to the IGF-1 levels. What they found was that protein and carbohydrates tend to increase IGF-1 the most, which is very similar to how it affects on insulin, and animal proteins tend to stimulate it more than plant proteins, whereas fats, they don't really have too much of an effect. When they looked at specific foods, it was milk, cheese, and yogurt, which tended to increase it the most, and the least was eggs and butter. So it wasn't the fat, perhaps, but all of the uh, proteins that may be stimulating the IGF-1. And it's relevant because uh, we have to know what foods we want to eat rather than targeting macronutrients. So when we're looking at IGF-1, we have to really make sure that we're not in the low level, which is malnutrition, but assuming that we're well-nourished, you also want to make sure you're not going too high because previously we used to say, well, we should have high levels, high levels of protein, um, but perhaps that's not such a good thing because then you're revving the growth strategy too much and there seems to be a trade-off between growth and longevity. That is, if you tend to grow, 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 you may not last as long. If you don't grow, you may live longer, but at the cost of being smaller or malnourished. And it's no different than, uh, for example, if you have a uh, car and you rev the engine really hard and drive really fast. Well, it's not going to last as long. You go faster, but it doesn't last as long. So there's that trade-off. So we see exactly this with the IGF-1 levels. There's a sweet spot, not too much and not too little. So what's a good strategy to use then? Because obviously we can adjust the foods we want to eat, but we can't avoid them completely. And this is where intermittent fasting really shines. In this next study, people look at the relationship between fasting and IGF-1 levels. And again, this was a meta-analysis where they combed through all the available data to see what is, what, what is known about the subject. And there was 10 studies found and 497 participants. When they looked at all of these studies, there again seemed to be no effect on IGF-1. But again, taking a closer look at the data, they're able to make some fascinating discoveries. Some of the studies had real caloric restriction where they went less than 50% of calories and others didn't. When they made this division of 50% 
calorie reduction versus those uh, those fasting strategies that didn't reduce their calories now you can see a clear evidence of the difference if you had a less than 50 percent uh, calorie restricting diet that is you're doing the fasting but you weren't really restricting what you're eating well they didn't really show much change in igf1 but when you could reduce those calories less to 50 less than 50 percent of the day then you see a nice decrease in IGF-1. Coming back to the question of how this relates to our dietary strategy, fasting is ideally positioned here because once again, you want not high levels and not low levels, and fasting actually fluctuates between the two. So when you're eating, you're eating normal foods and your IGF-1 is gonna go up, but we have that fasting level, it's gonna go back down. When you do the fasting, you want to get into that stage where you're getting very, very low calories, less than 50%, in order to get that decrease in IGF-1. And that's going to be the easiest way to balance both the highs and the lows and make sure that you're in this sweet spot. Interestingly enough, if you look at many religions, they do exactly that. So every day there's a normal fasting period from dinner to the next day's dinner, but that's probably not enough to lower IGF-1 levels. So a lot of religions, once a year uh, perhaps, or maybe more frequently on certain special days, such as Yom Kippur, for example, or Ramadan or Lent, uh, there are days where you have a full day of fasting or sometimes longer and that's going to really drive your IGF-1 levels down and therefore be able to get that balance between high and low. That's some of the science behind fasting and why it's really an ideal dietary strategy for certain things but control of the IGF-1 levels which may relate very heavily to your risk of cancer as well as longevity is exactly that. Thanks for watching everybody, I'll see you next time.